First, let me thank you for being one of my most supportive teachers and mentors in elementary school and also throughout life. Uh, what did you think about me returning to Houtling Elementary to teach basketry to students? Oh, Stacy, I was so honored and proud when you asked me if, if we could chat about this. Um, and I'm so proud of you and your journey. When, um, when teachers have students that, um, that leave their class at the end of the school year, we always wish, or I do anyway, that there was a crystal ball that I could just kind of check in on them as they go through school and see what happens when they're done with high school what kind of choices they make and where their life goes. And so it's just been an absolute treat to be able to see you, not just at the museums and um, at the Art Council with your exhibits, but more importantly, and I think most impactfully in the halls of Howling, which is the elementary school that you attended. And to have you come back to be a teacher peer with your former teachers, myself included, has just been an absolute treat and, um, and one of the most wonderful things that, that teachers can see and experience. The fact that you are poised and composed and skilled and a natural really, like I've always thought you can't make a teacher, a, a, someone has a teacher's heart and you can help them to, to perfect their craft but you can't force teaching onto someone, I don't believe. It has to be you know, a vocation as much of a profession. And I think you've got that. You've got that skilled teacher's heart and the ability and the wherewithal and the desire to share that with others it is just tremendous. And so it's been, um, it's really kind of been a dream come true to see you bring your skills back to uh, the elementary school that helped you on your way. Thank you. So often I will very gladly run into you in the hallway before or after my lessons. Yeah. Even in the hall, there is a lesson for the students that you are walking with. What's your favorite takeaway from our little random encounters? I have a couple actually. Um, this is this really was um, it is something really good to to think about and to and to focus on. Um, from the moment that uh, I see you and we greet each other and we explain our connection, the fact that you're a former student and someone who uh, who walked the halls of Houtwing as a student and that you've come back is an incredible role model and kind of, uh, I'd say like morale boost for students um, who are thrilled and encouraged when a grown up comes to share something with them. Not, not just their, their teacher, not just a specialist that's in the building every day like I am. Um, and so that, just that in itself, just having you there, I think is huge for kids to see. But you've always been so uh, patient and willing to share with the students. Usually I'm walking back and forth with a, a group of a couple of first graders to get a couple of second graders. Um, but those few minutes that we have, that's a teaching moment for them. You've shared your materials. You've talked about which class you're going to. Some of them have siblings in those classes with those teachers. You show them the project that they're going to work on. You've had tubs of your kind of raw um, bundled cedar before um, on the floor by your feet and you've take them, taken them out and let the kids hold those. So who knows how many future weavers and harvesters you've inspired just in those moments of passing in, in the hall. For, for me personally and very selfishly, uh, I just love to see you who have become such, uh, uh, I'll say mature, but that's not an age joke, uh, a mature and poised and learned person. Uh, and the fact that you demonstrate for kids and for me and for the teachers whose classes you go into and for all the teachers that know that you're in the building, what you demonstrate is that you are a lifelong learner. And we talk about that a lot at school, right? And it's not just book learning. That learning is dance and it's language and it's nature and it's, it's math and it's pattern and it's all the things that you bring 
to your weaving and to your instruction and to demonstrate to all of us and especially to the elementary kids that you're there to uh, work with and to teach um, that lifelong learning that learning doesn't stop and that it isn't just one path that there are all sorts of things that students can do now and in the future that's really powerful and and if you did nothing else but but touch one of those kids in that way to kind of open something in their head that lets them think I could do this too or to seek out culture camp in the summer right or or to go to uh, the Totem Heritage Center and really um, review uh, the exhibits like after COVID and uh, you know and to and for teachers to again after COVID be able to take students to um, see the the pieces in Saxman and the pieces at the Totem Heritage Center and there's a great exhibit at the the local Ketchikan Museum now as well with some beautiful um, uh, Alaska Native art uh, pieces uh, and cultural pieces in there that that you know might spark those kids to just go check it out and then perfect those skills on their own so we appreciate having you back anytime okay. <laughs> How do you incorporate cultural lessons into your studies and have you noticed a change or progression in what you can share throughout the years? Absolutely yes to that second part of that question. Um, when I, my um, instruction now is as a reading specialist, so I have small groups of students, not a whole class of 29. Um, when I did have whole classes, one of the things that I used to do um, in addition to uh, the kinds of field trips that we just talked about, right, to the Totem Heritage Center, to um, see the carvers and the carving and the, the totem poles at um, Saxman and the Beaver Clan House. Um, in addition to that, in class, I, I, I've always been fascinated by the natural abundance that indigenous peoples, certainly in, in the whole state of Alaska, but especially in this part of Southeast, utilized the everything from the woods, everything from the water, everything from the beach. Uh, it was and is for, for many people, but certainly historically, was uh, an incredible balance on the land. And the fact that community was, was so important for existence meant that, well, from what I've read, in the dark and the wet times, there was time for dance and time for song and story and time for craft. So a, a simple utilitarian ladle would have an incredibly carved and painted handle because the community made that possible by the fall and summer and spring harvesting and gathering and preserving of, of foods. Um, and so I, I always tried to, I'm certainly not expert, but I, I tried to stress to all students the incredible balance on the land that, um, that the indigenous peoples in this state um, had and the, and the way uh, folks lived for the most part. One of the things I used, um, and I've shared with others, I don't even think they're in print anymore, but it's a, a Bellerophon books published um, by Paul Summers, and I looked this up because I wanted to make certain that I had the, the correct author. Um, you might remember, Stacy. there were two volumes, and uh, the books are about 20 inches tall, um, and each totem pole is in two or three different pieces. So once they're colored, they're line drawings, and once they're colored using traditional colors with crayon or colored pencils, but that gave us the opportunity to talk about natural pigments, right? Where, where did that white come from? How, how did the, the, the black and the red that, that highlighted those form lines, how, do, how were they produced? And, and the poles represented in those books are Haida poles and, and Clinket and Simshan poles, mostly Haida and Clinket. They're in Klawak, they're in Saxman. So, so we could actually go see the pole that the artist rendered in a line drawing and talk about the story, not my story, but stories that I had read or stories that had been told to me from others whose stories they were. 
or that they had heard stories from other people. And I always tried to make that really clear as well. This isn't my story. This is what I've heard. But the fact that there was that connection between what we could talk about in class and what we could see in Saxman or at, uh, at Totem Bight or what they would have seen with relatives in Heidelberg or, or in Cloak on Prince of Wales Island, that that was an, a real connection to one very obvious and dominant piece of culture, cultural art and, and tradition. That was decades ago. And, and happily since then, um, there has been in our schools, even with the loss of the John Snow Malley program that I think we still had when you were in school, Stacy, um, and elder uh, women came and um, talked about fish camp and talked about their experiences as little kids and helped us to learn how to bead um, and to make little octopus bags and, and shared their traditional craft with us. Um, but, but sadly, we lost that funding and that experience and that connection with elders, I think, is so, so important. But there has been a resurgence in language at school, in um, cultural education, when COVID wasn't so much of a thing, uh, the opportunity for Clinket Haida dancers to come and share um, their, uh, their dance and story and song with us, celebrations of Elizabeth Paratrovich Day, as, as a powerful Alaskan woman, right? Early civil rights, powerful activist leader. Um, and that never used to be something that was celebrated in such a way at school. And to see that happen now, I think is, um, is far too late and maybe far too little, but it's really encouraging that um, all of our students, but especially the 30 to 40% of our school population that is Alaska Native students, um, see the importance of celebrating these, these artists, these activists, these storytellers. I, I think it would be really difficult. Um, I mentioned the, the Johnson O'Malley folks because um, I, I made connections with, with several of those, um, the elder women um, from uh, Saxman and, um, and from Ketchikan who, uh, who shared their information. And they also shared, tragically, often, their experiences as elementary kids, that this was not what they had experienced. Um, many had been um, ostracized and, um, and discriminated against in, in Ketchikan because they were Alaska Native students. Um, some had been at Wrangell Institute and, and shared fairly horrific experiences when they were at that boarding school. Um, and, and it was a tough lesson, I, I think, certainly for me and, and certainly for little kids to hear that that merely for speaking, or importantly for speaking their, their language, their first language, they were punished and, um, and treated horribly in, in many cases. Um, I think it was really important to have those elders at school. Not that it doesn't occur now, but it's not, um, it's a little bit removed now because it has been a couple of decades and, and um, many of those uh, folks who, who experienced that firsthand um, are, aren't living anymore, um, but those stories continue. And so that's not like a favorite thing, but it's something that I think we need to remember. And um, certainly um, with the, the tragic uh, instances of indigenous students um, being treated horribly and, and killed in, in boarding schools that we've, we've heard about in, in Canada, and we know that it occurred in this country as well. That's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, not a favorite lesson, but something I think that's really important. One of the favorite things, um, I think, to connect sort of the past tradition and the, and the present, um, I, would, uh, I would share with kids when we did uh, intertidal zonation study um, and talk again about 
the beach fringe and the mink and the marten and the deer that come down in the winter and, and the food sources there and the sources for skin and for protection. And to talk about the tide, um, the sea cucumber, the yane, the, um, the abalone, the other um, critters, the sea lettuce um, that was available on certain tides. And then the spring tides to get the black seaweed. And I was lucky enough, my husband and I, to have um, friends. I told you, um, I think Alice and David Demert um, showed us, you know, uh, where to get seaweed, what kind of tide, how to dry it, and shared, you know, this really important traditional use of the land with, with us. Um, and I would talk to kids about the importance of the sensitivity for the environment, not, not just in, in a, a cultural lens, but in a broader kind of worldwide lens, but then, it, then bring it back to the fact that indigenous peoples in this part of Alaska utilized the beach, the woods, the mountains, the berries, the oceans for, for eons, for tens of thousands of years with little negative impact and how important it is for all of us to try to pattern the way that we treat these resources in, in a similar way. I think also it's hard to discreetly talk about one specific kind of lesson. I'm sure you can relate to that. If someone said, what's your favorite weaving thing? Like, well, I like this part of this and I really like Raven's Tale and I'm learning something. Um, I think the fact that it is not separate, it's become not completely entwined and not perfectly kind of braided into what it is that we do every day, but it's far more common to hear um, the Clinkett language on the morning announcement. Um, it's far more common to see in the halls and classrooms uh, posters of, of foods that you can find on the beach um, and, uh, and pictures of um, regalia and, and elders, um, in, in perhaps in their dance robe or a mask or a, or a headdress. And that, I think, is kind of magical because it shouldn't be separate. It has to be entwined in everything that we do. It also has to be recognized separately. If, if you get my meaning, I, I, I don't think we need, I think we make, need to make sure that we don't diminish it by just saying we're gonna teach this, 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 and then we're gonna talk about culture. It has to also though, I think it has to be woven into everything we do so that it isn't other, it isn't different, it's all of us. And just like we um, address and celebrate uh, Filipino American culture um, and, and all the other um, historic and linguistic and, and ethnic um, traditions and history that we all bring, but because we are on here, the land of the Tantaquan, it's in, incredibly important for us to acknowledge that and to make sure that we teach that. Absolutely. Um, I think I do remember in fourth grade, I believe we did the um, dioramas of the of the fish camps. Yeah. One of I my most that. Yeah. one of my most favorite takeaways uh, from the program being at Houtling Elementary. And, you know, also, um, I do believe I remember taking on the tour with the museum with some friends and things like that. And, you know, one of the things that I always talked about was that, you know, the folks that had gone through those horrific times are people that have taught me in my lifetime. And it's important to remember that, you know, I'm still here. It's not that far removed, you know, and I'm going to be here hopefully for a pretty long time. Um, but it's, it's really important to remember that it's not that long ago. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it's not long ago at all. It's in living memory for many folks. And, um, and I saw um, something that said, every indigenous person you know is the sister, brother, son, daughter, niece, nephew, grandchild of someone who experienced boarding school terror for, for many folks, really, for lack of a better word. 
And if we don't acknowledge that, then we can't address it. And if we don't address it, we can't make sure it never happens again. We, 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 my mother was a high school teacher, history teacher, and she, she always said, not just that, you know, those, those who, who forget the past are doomed to repeat it, but, but not, not just merely to not forget it, but to actively learn about it and engage with it so that you honor the spirit of those who suffered and you take forth that, that honoring in, in a way that means that every human gets what they need and is treated with kindness and respect. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. But like you said, you, um, this is your, this is all of our history, but certainly it's your familial connection to history. I was talking to um, a woman in Metlakatla a couple of days ago. She's the, um, she teaches there. I think she's been there for three years. She grew up down South in Washington state, but she has generations. I think we chatted about this. She has generations of, her family that she can trace back in Metlakatla um, on Annette Island. And the connectedness that she felt as soon as she came to Metlakatla and the, the, the kids in her class that say, well, if you're her cousin, you must be my cousin. And, and you know, that, I think, as I alluded to before, the kind of connection, the kind of, you call it plating when you braid things, um, that braiding, together of culture and language and tradition and family and the absolute necessity to lean on one another means that you you couldn't exist on your own and and the fact that community and family is so important and community and family have been so detrimentally impacted by colonization in this area and many parts of the world, but certainly in Southeast Alaska, it, we need to acknowledge that and we need to teach that truly and honestly. Um, and we need to assure that um, it doesn't ever happen again, but we don't need to sweep it under the rug. So what was your um, introduction into the, the culture of the Northwest Coast? When I first, I, I was up here <laughs> on a floating processor in Bristol Bay um, in 1979, 1980, I think. And then when I moved back up in 1981, um, Michael and I lived on a little fishing boat and um, we got old charts and we read books about what, how things got named. And we started thinking about, well, they got named by this Spanish explorer, but there was a name and it was a place before that. They got named by Captain Cook and these British explorers and colonizers, but there were people and there were names before that. And so I started reading um, about Northwest Coast Native Art, and I started reading. There was a great program at that time through the State Museum um, where you could, um, you could write in, like it wasn't online, you had to fill out a form and say what you were interested in. Um, and that kind of changed as, as we had kids later, and we, we ordered books about kittens instead of other things. But initially we got lots of books about the history of Southeast and the peoples of Southeast and traditions and, and, and big like coffee table photo books. And, uh, and we started paying attention to um, the art in the area and the history of the peoples in the area. It was just really curiosity and, and the need to kind of have information about the part of the world that we were residing in and, and to kind of, um, to, to have knowledge, but also to honor that. And, um, and so we kind of did it on our own. Certainly once I started teaching, um, regardless of the fact that a lot of my students were Alaska Native students, I would have wanted to teach about the area and the peoples. 
but I think it's incumbent upon us as educators to acknowledge like what we were just talking about, the treatment of past generations, the, the, the subsuming of the culture in the dominant culture, and then also to acknowledge the increased interest and resurgence of that culture in dance and art and story and song and language that, that's been happening, you know, certainly in the last decades. Um, and, and so as a, as a lifelong learner, I, um, before we talked about cultural standards, we have wonderful ones in the state now. Uh, before I was on a committee la this last year to, um, to really revamp our um, certified um, teacher evaluation to include um, some information on the cultural standards so that we're assured that we are incorporating that information in our, our daily lessons or certainly in specific topics at, at which might be um, more appropriate at secondary. Um, those things are important, but, uh, but I think that all of us have to take it upon ourselves to familiarize ourselves with the indigenous peoples of the area that we inhabit as the stewards of the land for generations um, the Alaska Native peoples, the, the Clinkett and Simshan and Haida people in Southern Southeast uh, had uh, a rich tradition and culture. And um, I really wanted to know about that and, uh, and to be able then later to, to share it with students. So if you could learn one thing with uh, myself or another cultural artist, what would it be? I am going to hold you to teaching me how to um, not spin, kind of spin, yeah. right? Like the two spin, spin the speeder. Yep, you're going to help me learn that. And I fantasize about making, like creating something like from nothing. I mean, not really nothing because I know all the work that goes into preparing your materials. But to have a space in the air that then becomes a basket I think it's just magic. I, I've watched you work it. I've seen your pieces and I'm astounded by the skill and the artistry and the pattern that you turn into a tangible, usable piece of art. And so someday I'm going to have, have you share that skill with me. It would be my honor. <laughs> Um, and uh, here's a, one more question. Uh, what would you like to say to the Stacy Williams that is in fourth grade today? Golly, so many things. I think one thing I would say would be it gets better. I think a lot of kids need to hear that when they're nine or 10. The, the um, experience at elementary school can be frustrating. Um, other students aren't always as kind as we would wish. And so there's that kind of delicate balancing act, make sure that everyone feels kind and loved and supported. And, and sometimes that's difficult. Um, all of us deal with familial things and, uh, and stuff, you know, outside school. Uh, but to that student, I would say, Stacy, you're like on a roll. There, there's nothing that you can't do and I am so thrilled to see what it is that you do with your life as you grow. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Um, you know, you and your students and I deeply appreciate you sharing your knowledge and always your encouragement. So thank you for that. Well, I appreciate that, Stacy, and I thank you for this opportunity to share with others the uh, wonderful person, artist, young woman that you are, and I really appreciate this opportunity to just get to spend a little bit of time with you. So best of luck in all your endeavors, and uh, if you ever want to come back to be my student, you can do it. As we are all lifelong learners. That's thank right. You.